Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, An Agenda for Regaining America's Maritime Security and Competitiveness. Please welcome Brent Sadler, Senior Research Fellow in the Heritage Foundation's Allison Center for National Security. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our guest in the auditorium here at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., and of course to our guest online. Uh, before I get started, I, I do want to put a few notices like right out in front, uh, kind of the rules of the game today. It's going to be a fireside chat with the guest speaker. Uh, but again, there's going to be a fireside chat, and there's going to be followed by Q&A. So please be thinking as we go through our comments, your questions. Lean more towards questions, less statement, and the more the merrier when we get to that point towards the end of today's event. Um, which, by the way, today's event is very timely. And it's the beginning of a dialogue, actually. This is just the first of a series of these types of discussions and fireside chats with a lot of illuminaries and academic, but also leaders in DC that are important to this maritime, regaining America's maritime strength. And in recent months, as if we didn't need it, we've been reminded of the importance and the danger to our nation and our economy from enemies able to threaten shipping. The Houthis attacks in the Red Sea are only the most recent example of this. Almost two years ago, Russia invaded Ukraine for the second time and threatened global grain supplies, some countries overly reliant on grain coming from Ukraine and Russia, fertilizer for critical ag agricultural activities, and other key industrial elements and materials coming out of Ukraine and the Black Sea. But as we are here now, China is massing well over 200 maritime militia vessels and Coast Guard ships in the Philippine Scarborough Shoal. Yet another example of China's insert maritime insurgency against the rules-based maritime order. Meanwhile, in our Congress, there has been a growing bipartisan chorus calling for action and proposed solutions. From increased naval shipbuilding, improved access to commercial shipping that supports our military when it deploys overseas, both in peacetime, but also critically in combat. And expanding the nation's shipyard capacity to build and sustain our Navy. But this is only part of the challenge. Needed, in fact, is a fundamental refocus on regaining the nation's maritime competitiveness. This will require, of course, strengthening our naval forces to include the US Coast Guard. But this will be hindered as long as our maritime industrial base continues to lag and to be underinvested in. Last fall, in a Real Clear Defense article, our guest speaker called for action to strengthen our maritime industry as a national strategic imperative. Today, he joins us to discuss the important issue, this important issue and what has been accomplished and what has to be accomplished as we go forward. It is my pleasure to introduce Congressman Mike Waltz, representing North Central Florida and a 27-year veteran Green Beret. He is currently the chairman of the Subcommittee for Readiness of the House Armed Services Committee. As a decorated combat-tested Green Beret and former White House and Pentagon policy advisor, he understands the consequences of failing to deter our enemies and the arcane, arcane art of DC policy making. I must also point out that Congressman Waltz comes from a long line of naval veterans, a son and grandson of Navy chiefs. Somewhere along the way, he got off course and joined the Army. That path started with his graduation with honors from the illustrious Virginia Military Institute then serving world, worldwide as a special forces officer with multiple combat tours in Afghanistan, the Middle East, and Africa. For his actions in combat, he was awarded four bronze stars, two of which for valor. Congressman Waltz is also familiar with the inner workings of the Pentagon and White House, having been a defense policy director for Secretary's Defense Donald Rumfeld and Robert Gates, and having served in the White House as an advisor to the Vice President. But he is also a small business owner, who has created over 400 jobs and has repeatedly been listed as one of the fastest growing private companies in America. So when it comes to getting the complete picture on what is required and what's at stake in the maritime challenge before us today, few come as prepared and as experienced. Congressman Waltz, the podium is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, you know, as my um, as my uncles and and uh, grandfathers and others said when I 
decided to defect from a Navy family and, and go Army. They said, you know, everybody makes, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, uh, but I got to tell you, um, this is a, I don't want to say crisis issue, but it's getting there. Uh, and it could be a crisis uh, in our time. And I just can't thank Heritage uh, once again for, for taking the time to dive into what I think to many may seem like a somewhat niche issue. Uh, but if you take a step back and um, if you really kind of pull the thread, and one of the silver linings from COVID was that we appreciated how much after that supply chains matter and how thin they are, how fragile they are. Uh, and, you know, we just kind of, I think, have become very accustomed as a historically maritime nation. We just show up to the store and the stuff is there. Uh, and it's there cheap uh, and it, with real-time logistics that, that really haven't been tested in the modern era. Um, it just kind of happened by magic. And I think COVID made us all take a step back and, 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 put, a, and put a spotlight on that. So, that's one framework with which we'll be talking today is just how our economy runs uh, and how fragile the, uh, the international dynamic of that, whether it was the Somali pirates, whether it's now the Houthis, uh, whether it is an adversary that controls now over 60% of global container traffic, which is the Chinese Communist Party, um, or we have a major we have a major global uh, near-peer or peer-to-peer -peer conflict. Well, we should probably listen when Chairman Xi comes to San Francisco to the APEC summit and tells the President of the United States, reunification from this perspective, I'm using his words, reunification with Taiwan's happening one way or, or another. Um, oh, by the way, over a strait that has 90% of the, of the world's largest shipping. So, we look at it from that perspective, and then I look at it from from the you know from a from a true sea power uh, perspective, and the situation is is not good, uh, not only from a shipbuilding standpoint, but from a readiness standpoint, uh, and then a workforce standpoint. So, my team, uh, and by the way, I request a Navy fellow. We get a military fellow when you're on the Armed Services Committee, and I specifically request a Naval Surface Warfare officer uh, or a Naval officer. Uh, every single year that I've been in Congress because I'm banging my head against the bulkhead of, of naval readiness. But we can unpack uh, we can unpack that as well. So last year we wrote uh, America Needs a, a National Maritime Strategy uh, as a bit of a wake-up call that we just don't have enough uh, warships, commercial ships, uh, shipbuilding capacity, uh, and that if current events um, currently are and can make this a critically uh, it could make this a lethal issue to not only our economy, but our, our national security. Uh, secondarily, um, unfortunately, as we've seen in manufacturing, as we've seen uh, through what I think was uh, through the NAFTA deal, through the export of manufacturing, that the expertise, the know-how, and the infrastructure left with it, I think the same things happened to our shipbuilding. Um, industry. And after years of neglecting those elements, uh, now even our Navy is struggling uh, to build warships and to keep them at sea and to keep them ready. Uh, and again, if we're not careful, we won't be able to, not only we won't be able to fight in the way that we need to, we won't be able to deter, uh, and then we won't be able to keep them resupplied if inevitably a conflict goes longer than we plan. Uh, I think personally uh, that, and, I, and I, Senator Kelly um, uh, believes this as well, that the country has become too comfortable allowing our greatest adversary to build the majority of the world's ships. Uh, I mean, just to put it, just to put it plainly. Uh, and just the, just the numbers, which we'll dig into, but when you're looking at 5,500 5,500 ships under the Chinese flag and less than 200 under the United States. Houston, we have a problem. 
Uh, and that's what we'll look at, you know, what we're going to, to try to do about it. So we can talk about our reliance on foreign shippers. We can talk about uh, the, the plans of the Chinese Communist Party to disrupt our economy, as stated by their leaders. Don't take it from me. But really what I want to talk about uh, today is a call to action. Um, we can prioritize shipbuilding, we can prioritize shipping in a way that it is competitive and profitable. Uh, and at the end of the day, we can rebuild the United States capacity uh, as a seafaring power. Uh, because certainly, our economy has dependencies that must be, uh, must be uh, protected. So this isn't just, as, I, as we stated in our strategy, this isn't just a congressional issue. This is an administration issue, plus Congress, plus industry, uh, and, and plus our, our educational system. So that together, uh, I think we can stop punting the problem down the field, so to speak, use a good football analogy, uh, and, uh, and get to work. And that's what I, I look forward to talking to talking with you today about. So thanks so much for joining us. All right. Yeah, that was a clap push. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, so, so thank you again. And I very much appreciate, as, an, as, an, as a Navy man myself, for many years, drawing attention to the sorry state of our nation's maritime sector. It's more than just naval shipbuilding. It, it can exist. Effective naval shipbuilding can exist with a good industrial base. And I, and I agree, and I'd like to tell you characterize this as a crisis issue. One number to kind of put also out there to kind of capture this, the economic side of it is, before COVID, there were about 80,000 port visits to the United States to conduct our trade, to keep the lights on, the food shelves stocked, but also for people's livelihood. And as you mentioned, there's less than 200 flagships, but of that, there's less than 100 that are effective in trade. So if we get ourselves into a shooting war, we're going to be relying on others That's to right. keep the industry moving. So with that in mind, and, and with your, your very, uh, very good comments, opening comments, what actually drew you to this issue? And if you can kind of give us, why is it so urgent now? Yeah, so a couple of things. Again, um, I've been very focused on, you know, really the, the lack of ability of the United States to build and produce things. Um, anymore. Like, mm. Case in point, uh, you know, we, we had a round, and, a round with the Defense Logistics Agency over critical minerals, which, by the way, we had a massive stockpile post-World War II. We've essentially sold that off over the years. Uh, and now we have, I mean, we have a huge dependency issue. Uh, I mean, you've, you've seen the debates over EVs, right? Where does the cobalt come from? Where does the manganese come from? Where does the lithium come from? We used to mine it here through, for a variety of reasons. Those mines have been shut down. Even if we reopened them and got through the permitting reform, we still have to, we were mining all of those raw uh, minerals that we need to make a modern economy go. We still have to ship them, not to any country, but mainly to China. So we've got an issue there uh, and for the refining and then ship them back. Uh, so what, you know, long way of saying or an example of saying I've continued to see as I sit on armed services, intel, and foreign affairs, we have these critical choke points to where our greatest adversary can defeat us or deter us before any shooting uh, even starts. And if you look at how, I, I mean, I've got a, uh, I've got a two-year-old, um, by the way, God bless my wife, she let me name him Army, so go Army. <laughs> Kid you not. With an IE, though, not a Y. But uh -huh. uh, if you look at how we reacted to a formula shortage, right? I mean, it was, it was literally people's hair on fire and mm -hmm. scavenging. Look at the toilet paper uh, issue under COVID. I mean, our economy, we've become so accustomed to how well functioning our economy is uh, that key shortages mm -hmm. truly I think could could bring us to a crashing halt. And then the other piece too is, you know, as chairman of readiness, we have a, which we'll we'll get into. We have a serious readiness is, yeah. issue. When you look at in an A two A D, you know, a counter access environment where uh, our adversary is building a massive missile fleet. 
designed to sink our carriers, designed to push us further and further away from shore, designed to have us, what they believe, take unacceptable casualties, even to get close to uh, the fight in the Western Pacific, our greatest strength still, asymmetric advantage, is our underwater service, is our submarine fleet. Well, and this is a public number now, well, when 40% can't get out of the shipyards. Uh, and that's not necessarily, that's not a dig on the Navy. That is workforce issues. That's labor law issues. That's, I mean, we literally just don't have the steel, the aluminum, the wrench turners, mm -hmm. and oh, by the way, the shipyards uh, and, and others, and, and, you know, and other things we need. We've just allowed the entire ecosystem and infrastructure to badly, badly atrophy, and it, it, it's just apparent mm -hmm. uh, everywhere that we look. Oh. Um, the second question, I mean, I, I do also want to draw attention again to the letter that was signed by yourself and Senator Kelly, along with, I think, 17 other bipartisan, bicameral members of Congress just last week asking for the president to take action on this. And so clearly, you're a man of action. And as you have kind of laid out the problems, what do you hope to accomplish this year and looking further down the road? What are some of the things you've got in mind? Yeah, so, I mean, just to, just to belabor the gravity of the issue a little bit more, you know, one of the things that has become apparent to us, to Senator Kelly, uh, to Senator Scott, to rep my, my ranking member, uh, Representative Garamendi from, uh, from Florida, the 17 other co-signers, I mean, the, the, the Chinese Navy, if you look at the trend lines on track to reach for maybe even mm -hmm. 500 ships, we're on an opposite trend line of going down to 290 and even less. They can obviously concentrate their ships uh, in one area. Ours is spread all over the world. So the disparity is great and even greater. And then you add that theirs are new uh, and ours are aging. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I don't mean to ever make everybody want to drink, but uh, if you <laughs> have a bar here at Heritage, yeah. it's, it's not a good situation. But what has become apparent is that, uh, or it may be obvious to many of you, it's really cemented in our mind, this shipbuilding um, uh, overmatch that the Chinese Communist Party is developing is on the back of their commercial industry. And when you look at the fact that you could fit every one of our shipyards, public and private, inside of their single largest, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the fact that they're building, I mean, just by... Uh, numbers that they're building 1,500 large ships of all kinds, cargo, tankers, what have you, but 1,500 per year, and we're building less than 20? I mean, this is a massive, massive disparity. Uh, so what, we, what, yeah. the, what the heck are, uh, are we going to do about it? Well, you know, we've got some authorities that I think we just need, frankly, some a push yeah. uh, for uh, for the um, for the administration to really embrace and for the Navy uh, for the Navy and others to prioritize uh, it is notable that the members who signed on to our letter to the president they're from the Financial Services Committee mm -hmm. they understand the nature of it they're from the Transportation Committee and from the Armed Services Committee that this really is a not to belabor the term but a, a whole of government approach and I think, first and foremost, we need a national coordinator that is empowered, uh, a maritime czar, so to speak, to really get their circle around where the gaps are in authorities and appropriations. Uh, but where, for example, you know, we could resurrect uh, President Bush's 1989 presidential directive to what we're asking of the president uh, is, to, is to make this a presidential issue. And then finally, I know this is long answers, but I, it was incredibly frustrating to me uh, to have Secretary Austin testify that despite $1.2 trillion in the bipartisan infrastructure deal designed to go to uh, railroads and bridges and, and, and of debate was how much of it was social infrastructure versus more mm -hmm. traditional hard infrastructure, airports and what have you. You know how much of it went to our shipbuilding capacity? Zero. Mm -hmm. And the Secretary of Defense wasn't even consulted, according to his, according to his testimony. So I think that was a tremendous miss. Those dollars are going to be spent over some amount of time, and we're also asking that this 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 czar 
repurpose some of that into you know what is one of the lifebloods of our industry, and that's our, our shipyards and shipbuilders. Yes. Well, an, another number that kind of comes to mind based on, on, on your comment there is in 1987, the last time that we really did, the nation really did a review. It was really the tail end of, of Reagan's administration, but going into Bush and the, the, the document that, that, that you talked about, NSD, that lays out the importance of commercial shipping as a strategic sector. And that study in 1987 said that the nation needed 650 ships, commercial ships to sustain a war against the Soviet Union. Now, our economy is growing four times. One could do an extrapolation and say we need four times that. But at less than 200, only of which less than 100 are even viable in an economic sense, yeah. uh, we have serious problems. Uh, with that in mind and the fact that, this, that you've got 19 people already signed on, the impression that I'm left with is that there's a larger growing crowd. Is it your sense that, that this issue that more and more of your, your peers on the Hill, in the Senate as well as on the, on the Hill in both parties, uh, is there a sense of urgency that's growing amongst your peers? Well, yes and no. Um, the, the sense of urgency, and I find this in a number of spaces, uh, are tend to be those uh, that are getting tortured by the classified briefs in the, <laughs> in, in, in the intel on a week in and week out basis, right? So if you're sitting on the committees, I am, I'm, you know, I'm a masochist and I get a triple, a triple dose. But it, basically, if you're a member that is plugged in on the national security side, you see the issues, mm -hmm. you see how they're outpacing us, uh, you see the readiness issues, and then you see, frankly, their plans to, to cl cut off global yeah. choke points, right? Yeah. Uh, or, um, for example, is, as uh, a key Chinese official said during, um, during COVID, you know, that, that they would have no problem cutting off, for example, our antibiotics, of which we don't make here anymore, or 85% of our oncology medicine, which we don't make here anymore. And even if we did, you still need shipping to get a lot of the raw components. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that basically that economic warfare is baked into how they view uh, this strategic competition uh, with the United States. And apparently, if we buy their rhetoric, and I think we should, whether it's Xi or Putin or Tehran, I think we should believe them uh, when, they, when they broadcast what they're going to do, that that is you know, the increasing uh, mm -hmm. willingness to use it. And to your point on the numbers, Gulf War, uh, 1991, mm -hmm. we used 400 ships from the Ready Reserve Fleet uh, and others that, that we activated uh, to get our divisions over to the Middle East. Today, we have 46. Mm -hmm. uh, and several, a number of them are steam powered. So even if we tried to activate all the 46, uh, I don't know that we could, number one. And then number two, I don't know that we could crew them. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the yeah. issues with the maritime, with you know, with the workforce issue, not only from a kind of a wrench turning, welding, plumbing, you know, trades issue, but then actual maritime crews yes. where we've also outsourced to countries like the Philippines and, mm -hmm. and, and Bangladesh and others. Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> no, there's a we need to get going. There was a rich discussion on the, the human capital piece, both shipyard workers, but also the, the merchant marines. Yeah. So there's a whole deeper conversation, but I'm cognizant of the time, and I do want to get the audience's uh, participation in here. So just a, 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 a forewarning, uh, we'll be going to the audience here first in the room and then online for a few questions. But I did want to make one, one statement. We haven't touched on the Chinese control of ports. And you mentioned choke points. And I had a group up here from Aid Data, which is based down in Williamsburg, mm -hmm. at William and Mary. And they re released a report about where the Chinese are looking for bases. But behind that is a very rich decade plus research and financial forensics. And they, they control almost 100 ports located throughout the world. No surprise, yeah. many of those ports are near the choke points. So they, they have the ships. They also have the ports, and so it's just a matter of the Chinese Communist Party deciding to turn the screws on us mm -hmm. to, put, to basically sanction the United States. And so in many respects, the tables could be turned where we have been the sanctioner, we could be the sanctioned in the future. Yeah, and this has been, I mean, those who have studied it, it's, it's, it's a, not a pretty picture. I mean, we know what happened in the port in Sri Lanka through yes. debt diplomacy, which is, which is if you look at the flow of shipping from the Middle East, uh, through the Indian Ocean to the Moluccan Straits, 
Uh, that is, I mean, that is absolute key terrain, but just it's been part and parcel for how the CCP uh, has very unfairly, wrongly, in violation of WTO, you know, uh, um, um, tenants. But, you know, just case in point, three ports on the eastern side of the Panama Canal, one gets in economic trouble, uh, the, the CCP moves in through its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, scoops up the distressed assets, here's the kicker, uh, now has that port, state subsidizes the fees, drops them to near zero, puts the others now into distress yes. and starts uh, gobbling up key shares. So between debt diplomacy, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and those kind of very aggressive tactics, it's not, uh, it's, it's not only the Panama Canal, it's now we understand the, the, their naval presence in, um, in Djibouti, right in the key entrance of, um, uh, of the Red Sea which is building piers now that could accommodate the largest ships in the world, also an aircraft carrier. Their search for ports on the western side of Africa. Uh, it, yeah, we could, we could go down the list, yes. but yeah, it's part of a full on, you know, it's part of Xi's um, approach to replace the United States as a global hegemon, hegemon yes, by, you know, by the 100th year anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, if not sooner, yeah. if we keep on this trajectory. So with this, I'll open up first to questions in the audience. So why don't we go first to hear the gentleman in the middle. Hello there, my name is Sujo Lipluri, and my question is, we have a lot of untapped talent among the Gen Z, among the younger generations, where a lot of younger Americans are finding it difficult, for example, to find traditional modes of employment. To what extent do you think policymakers can take like incentives or steps to perhaps reallocate this huge labor force of young people that we have towards more technical professions, towards the industrial base, mm -hmm. and to create more jobs at home, and perhaps a human capital exchange to lead to some potential solutions in the future to the pressing problems we're facing today? Yeah, so I think part of that is, um, you know, government has certainly a role. I think part of it's societal, uh, frankly. I mean, we need to make the trades cool again. Um, I'm not gonna say great again, that caused some people to get upset, but, yeah. um, but we do. And I could tell you just from my parents and grandparents' generation, you kinda, you know, coming out of the greatest generation, uh, you'd kind of made it if you got your your son or grandkids off to the four-year anniversary, uh, you know, university with the with a traditional degree. When I talk to my manufacturers, especially down in the Space Coast, uh, where you can literally um, enter into a trade, an apprenticeship, uh, and by 19 to 20, you have no debt and you're making six figures. Uh, it is. I, I just think we as a society need to try to value that more. Um, but there's also, for example, I worked with a uh, now deceased uh, Democrat uh, chairwoman of science and technology, Eddie Bernice Johnson, on better understanding why we have such under participation for minorities uh, and, and women in trades. We just have a, we have a numbers problem. We're due to be 10 million jobs short in both STEM and trades uh, over the next decade Yet when you have a, a 27 participation, percent participation rate from women and 11% minorities, that's a, that's a huge issue. Uh, we're just not out of our university system, in my view, creating the workforce that we need. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna to, to denigrate the liberal arts. It's, it's wonderful and has its role, but uh, I think we could incentivize, and I'm, I'm, I'm in, courage to see a lot of Fortune uh, 500 and even tech companies discarding the need for a college degree. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, though, we need to keep it based on a meritocracy. There needs to be some type of barriers, uh, not barriers to entry, but, um, but some type of criteria mm -hmm. um, that, that proves that, you're cap that obviously that you're capable. Uh -huh. so, now, amen. As, a, as an engineer myself, but one of the things just to, to, to pile on that is the nation needs na more naval architects. Without naval architects, you can't set good re uh, requirements for shipbuilding. Bad requirements for shipbuilding, you get a lot of problems and delays and cost overruns. So I'm going to come to the front row here in a second for the next question, but I wanted to go I want to give, oh. I just want to oh. give the Navy, um, I do want to give the Navy credit for investments that they are starting to make. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the last couple of years. Yes. Uh, I believe it was 280 million, 250 million in not only training and kind of trying to jumpstart this workforce. Mm -hmm. They've started with uh, with our with our submarine fleet, which is the most technical. But I think that will will pay benefits across the board. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go to the online question for, from Nicole. Okay, this question is for one or both of you. Uh, the Navy and Merchant Marine repeatedly say that allies will fill naval gaps, but only the UK Navy is fully helping in the Red Sea, and foreign ship owners are rerouting US flagships. Do you think that the Navy is, that naval allies are reliable, and can you speak a little bit about this? Well, I think it depends on which allies you're, you're talking about. And I have long been uh, very publicly frustrated with the lack of investment in defense of our European allies. And just I don't know how to put it more bluntly. If I had um, if I had a a dollar for every speech that we wrote going back 20 years, practically begging our European friends, and they can be good friends and allies, you can have tough conversations to live up to their commitment of two percent of GDP uh, for their for their defense industry, I'd, I'd be a lot wealthier and maybe doing mm -hmm. something else. I don't know, but they haven't. Uh, and Today, you know, the, the NATO summit is going to be in Washington this summer, uh, and I just had a, a fascinating conversation with the speakers of the parliament of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, who are upwards of 4%, are really right on the front lines and quite scared with, uh, with you know, Putin staring down their throats. And I, I asked them, what kind of conversations do you have with your German, Italian, French, and other counterparts who have so repeatedly underinvested. So transfer that today. Here we have uh, the vast majority of Europe's energy uh, in terms of fossil oil and natural gas uh, flowing through the Red Sea, flowing through the Suez Canal, and the only participant from Europe in the, in the, in the coalition in terms of ships actually shooting uh, and defending global commercial shippings and this critical supply line are the Brits. Why is that? And why aren't we asking much tougher questions of, uh, uh, of our allies? Switch to the Pacific, I think you're seeing, and I, and I was able to meet with the Prime Minister of Japan and personally thank the Japanese. They are going to live up to their 2% defense commitment. And if you look at 95% of global shipping now, uh, our shipbuilding is in South Korea, Japan, uh, and China. So I do think you're seeing many of our, uh, uh, our Asian allies stepping up. They realize uh, the issue. And I was, I'm also co-chair of the, of the India caucus. Mm -hmm. uh, we just signed, I think, a, 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 what I hope to be the first of many ship repair agreements uh, with the Indian Navy uh, in Mumbai. Uh, about the same time that we were out there, we had Modi here uh, for his joint address to Congress, uh, one of only a few in history that have done it twice. I think the U.S.-India relationship is critical uh, going forward. I think the Indian, the Indian Ocean is critical uh, uh, going forward. And so when I look at the quad and where and the potential uh, for those relationships, I think those are, um, those are moving in the right direction, the right trend lines. I might just add that uh, when you- In the AUKUS, oh. I would be, oh, I would, yeah. I would be <laughs> It negligent, and you know, I criticize this administration for a lot of their policies. That I want to give them absolute kudos for. I think that is the. Um, I'm a little dubious that we'll end up getting net net more submarines uh, at the end, but regardless, I think it's a step in the right direction in pillar two on the technology sharing and breaking down the barriers. I also lead an FMS task force, which is probably another conversation. Breaking down those bureaucratic barriers to um, arming. Uh, and ensuring the lesson we should learn from Ukraine, arm your allies before the war, uh, not after they've had whole swaths of the country devastated. So. Uh, it's another yeah. great point. I, I would just add that a lot of those key maritime players actually are treaty allies. The Philippines, one of the largest of merchant mariners in the world, um, that's number one. Japan and South Korea, the leaders in modern shipbuilding. Now, they don't compare to the Chinese in scale, but they certainly surpass them in quality and also some of the niche capabilities. And so we as a nation need to do better at leveraging and working together with our allies. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, in this commercial maritime sector because that's the foundation on which naval power rests. And we're relearning that very Mahanian kind of precept. And with that, I'm going to go to uh, old friend Steve Wills here in the front, and then you, sir. Hey, uh, thank you very oh, much. Oh, oh, wait for the bell. Oh, there we go. <laughs> thank you so very much. I've been told usually I'm loud enough. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for being here today. And thanks to Brent Sadler and Heritage for putting on this event. I'm Dr. Steve Wills from Center of Maritime Strategy. I work for Admiral James Fogo, who is also here with me. Uh, in getting at growing the Navy itself, the last time we substantially grew the Navy was in the 1980s. And the goal at that time was 600 ships. But the Navy had another tool in its pocket at that point, and that was an operational level of war maritime strategy developed by the Chief of Naval Operations staff with direct inputs from the fleet commanders that would lead that strategy in both peace and war. We haven't had a strategy like that really since the end of the Cold War. Congress requires that the Navy produce a 30-year shipbuilding program already. Is it time now for Congress to require that the Navy produce an operational level of war maritime strategy that better explains why we need to grow the fleet and all the other maritime capabilities that you've suggested, sir? Thank you so very much. Yes, uh, and uh, we're working on NDA language to that uh, to that effect. And I have, uh, I think, a look at it by T. I know it's this <laughs> week. Uh, I sit down with the CNO, uh, absolutely along those lines, and not to sound. I don't mean this to sound flippant at all, but you can't have a 30-year shipbuilding strategy that changes every year. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have to give industry some predictability. And look. I'll take it on, I'll take it on the chin. Congress and uh, our completely dysfunctional budgeting process with the CR kick the can, you know, I mean, that in and of itself would help if we actually did our job uh, on time. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of pieces, yes. Um, we have to help industry help us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll just, could, could, we're in violent agreement. I don't. It, 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 you, I couldn't lay it out any better than, than, than you just did. And then finally, I think we, I mean, we need to hear from uh, two two additional things. We need to hear from the commander in chief, whether it's this one or a new one, of why this is critical. Uh, I could tell you when I go to kind of my, um, you know, my constituents, uh, oftentimes their responses. That's why we got to bring manufacturing back home. You know, if we, if we didn't have it over there, if we had it here, this wouldn't be an issue. No, it still would be uh, absolutely an issue because it's not just imports and manufacturing here. Uh, it's realizing how much we export that makes, uh, that makes our economy go as well. So, um, I, you know, I, that's why we did a bipartisan, bicameral uh, letter to the president. And regardless of who that commander in chief is, we, we've, got to, we've got to make shipbuilding great again. All right. So we got another question in the front, but as you bring the mic down, I uh, just want to add the Secretary of the Navy kind of teased out a potential change to the trilateral maritime strategy, maybe adding mar the maritime administration, which would bring, I think, a missing piece, and a very obvious missing piece to this. And so I'm hopeful there's something real that comes forward in that, that we have a quadrilateral maritime strategy that includes the, the commercial. No, that's, a, that's a great point, Britt. And I'll just add, look, I think there's a, we're talking about a lot of longer term solutions of rebuilding and then you know, revitalizing uh, an entire industry. I think in the short term, again, if you believe uh, Xi's directive to have his military, his Navy ready to go 2027, that's, mm -hmm. that's right around the corner. That's the next, that's the next presidential term. You know, do we look at taking modules from, and I know this is heresy to my, to my uh, shipyard members, uh, but do we look at taking modules from South Korea and from Japan and assembling here or key components. I, I just think we have to get out, you know, do we have a surge of, of uh, gently used uh, uh, ships, right? Uh, uh, Representative Garamendi has an idea that, that he's putting language towards of do we take the Jones Act fleet uh, and harden some of it at a, at a relatively fraction of a cost in terms of comms and um, and, and crew protection that could be activated uh, in a time of emergency. It, it, you know, look, and our shipyard members, this is the congressional dynamics, will say, no, 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 until we will never get this growing capacity until we put it all through our own shipyards. 
I don't disagree, but I think there needs to be short-term kind of a little more out-of-the-box components of the reality that we're in as we you know, rebuild this industry for the long term. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Michael Krause, Dr. Michael Krause. He, you've really opened our eyes. Uh, I'm an army bloke, uh, but uh, I saw the light too, yeah. and became a logistician. I founded a company called Secure Chain, dedicated to, to uh, security of the supply chain. My question goes like this. You, you've highlighted European ports uh, that are controlled by the Chinese. The, the 15 largest ports are totally controlled, including Hamburg, Antwerp, and, and others. Is it time for another port, for example, in Orkney, Scotland, that is focused on uh, the Arctic, uh, uh, the Arctic route, uh, the Northwest Passage? Yeah. Canada is keenly interested in this. So is UK government. Mm -hmm. I've been working on this for two years. What's your view? on the Arctic route uh, and the Northwest Passage and a new port. Yeah, thank, so, thank well, I mean, it's one more reason that we need to get going sooner than later uh, on a, a national, um, on a national, not a defense, but a national maritime strategy. That is becoming more and more a reality. Uh, China is asserting itself as a near peer Arctic nation. Um, uh, why does that, I mean, Russia just stepped down as the head of the Arctic Council, so it was kind of moribund given the atrocities in Ukraine uh, for a while. But the, the Northwest Passage uh, and, and the realization of those shipping lanes because of the shrinking ice fields is increasingly, increasingly a reality. Here's the issue. Uh, and I know Canada is incredibly interested I would love the Trudeau government to make some real investments uh, in its own icebreakers rather than gently encouraging us to build more, um, number one. Number two, we have, if you look at, so it's a military issue in the sense that we're exposed up there. A lot of our radars, sensors, uh, even our, um, well, if you think of any type of exchange of a conflict with the Russians in particular, it doesn't come over the equator, it comes over the North Pole. Uh, and we never thought we'd have to defend that stuff up there. Nobody could even get to it. Now, increasingly, you can. Uh, so that's one piece. We need to be able to defend our sensitive assets up there. Number two, uh, like for instance, uh, China just pushed a, ship, uh, a fishing fleet that was larger than the entire US Navy. <laughs> up through the Bering Strait, and when they move into areas, just ask the Chileans and the Galapagos, they strip mine the entire ocean. Uh, it's also becoming an issue for native populations uh, up there that are, that are reliant on, uh, you know, on these pristine oceans for their way of life. And then finally, a lot of oil and gas, uh, you know, previously untapped, untested reserves are being, um, you know, are, are being uncovered that they're very interested in and the Russians are in. But if you, look at, if you look at the times that are cut down, if you head north out of Northern Europe and across the Northern uh, part of Russia and into Asia, and then also their ability to bypass what have been traditional strategic uh, uh, choke points that we've had great influence on, namely the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, uh, it's a game changer. Uh, but if you look at our Arctic, you know, if our ice breaking fleet is two, um, really one and a half, you know, if you look at how old, uh, how old they are, and if you look at the delays on building uh, the, the, the new fleet compared to the 60 that the Russians have uh, and, uh, and the nuclear, I don't even know how many nuclear that they have, but it's, it's, a, it's a solid yeah, dozen yes. uh, at this point and growing. Again, all the more <laughs> the sense of urgency that, that we have. The Arctic is a huge component. So I'm going to go to online, uh, and then we'll probably see if there's, I think, on this wing over here, if there's any questions. If not, we'll be going over. OK. Um, what is your impression of intelligence community support to Navy acquisition programs, particularly in the context of cybersecurity and operations and supply chain risk? And where do you believe improvements are most needed? Wow. That's a. That's a lot to, that is a lot to unpack. Um, 
I believe that uh, we could do a lot more when it comes to getting our entire acquisition system on blockchain um, and really having a much more transparent, um, when you get in uh, trans, uh, a lot more transparency on the supply chain going all the way down. Um, but when you look at some of the major OEMs, the major primes, and you're looking at literally thousands and thousands of subcontractors, whenever Congress is pushed on this, both industry and the Pentagon seem to throw up their hands. And that may not be fair. It's a huge issue. Uh, but I think if we looked at blockchain and other technologies that are out there, we could get much more visibility. Still doesn't get to the raw materials issue. We've uh, actually, uh, I'll take a little bit of credit. It was, it was primarily my legislation is mandated uh, that the Pentagon create a critical mineral stockpile to somewhat mirror the Strategic Petroleum Reserve so that we can have that, uh, in, again, as a, as a short-term kind of go to war if we have to fix while we deal with the longer, more politically sticky issues of permitting reforms, mining, refining, and bringing a lot of those supply chains back home. What was the other part of your, aside from, there was another key component aside from the supply chain um, and the understanding. Oh, the Intel support to yeah, yes. Intel support to shipbuilding. You know, I don't have a great answer, but I'll ask um, because it. You know, obviously our Intel support tends to be uh, it tends to be much more operational. Mm -hmm. um, I could tell you that the community is very focused right now in learning the lessons. One of the key lessons we're learning from Ukraine is the EW, uh, is, the electronic, is the electronic warfare components, uh, and how we can both defend ourselves, but also utilize that uh, more effectively, and how we build that into the front, front end of our requirements and our naval design. Mm -hmm. And then really, it's all dependent on the first, war, the first shots that we're seeing in every war game are fired, fired in space and cyberspace. And the space component and how dependent we are but the growing dependencies and advancements our adversaries are. It's one thing to have a carrier killer missile. It's another thing to be able to track ours around the globe and target with the, with the fidelity that, that you need. Um, so that space counter space component is, I mean, that's, it's, it's checkmate. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> thankfully, a lot of people in this town made a lot of jokes with the creation of the Space Force, but I, thought, uh, and I was a real advocate of getting the Space Force at an equal uh, seat at the table so that they can feed, um, you know, feed the Navy what it needs, not only on the front end, but on the operational end. And I just would add, and if there's a question over on this side, yes, sir, as we're getting the mic to you, um, commercial shipping relies on the internet and the fiber optic cables. And so it's it's got the military piece, but it's also the commerce. Well, 95% of global data, 99% of phone traffic travels through undersea yes. cables. Uh, and it really didn't get covered, but the Houthis just threatened to cut, um, you know, the, the, the one of the cables flowing through the Bob. And, um, you know, I'll continue to make the point that they wouldn't be able to do that without support of their state sponsor, Iran. Hmm. So, I mean, all roads lead back to Iran in that yes. conflict. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, Ted Voorhees. And just as a caveat to my question, I totally agree with what you're saying. I totally agree with your prescriptions. But here's the question. Mm. I mean, isn't it possible that uh, a, a reasonable person could ask, has the United States just said, I don't want any more wars? I don't want to have a war with China. I don't want to pay for policing the entire world. I don't want a Navy that's relied on by everybody else. Uh, you know, we've got a huge political problem here, and it's not just the administration. It's sort of widespread. It's in Congress, it's the people. Just what are your thoughts on changing that, let's call it an isolationist tendency? Yeah, and that's on, look, I mean, and that those tendencies are on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I would push back on the sense that they're not new. Um, they may get, you know, given our media dynamics now, they may get a louder voice, but look at the struggles FDR had, um, you know, despite, you know, Europe truly in flames 
to get uh, to get the United States in, engaged. Uh, point one, point two. Uh, I do think, and I see at least on my side of the aisle, there is an absolute awareness of the threat of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and when you put it in the context of, again, bringing our supply chains home, the influence, whether it is from our farmland uh, and our university endowments, uh, I mean, I could continue to, to kind of go down the list. There is an absolute realization there. Um, but you do have to couple with, and it is just a reality, there is a real exhaustion after 20 years of Middle East wars. And when we, you know, when people who aren't as nearly as plugged in as everyone in this off, you know, audience, when, you know, my uncle who's a Harley mechanic in North Florida and, and it's kind of making it week to week sees us, wait a minute, you know, what, we're bombing Yemen? We're, you know, and if you are plugged in, didn't we just tell the Saudis and the Emiratis to stop bombing uh, the Houthis? Uh, and wait, why do we have troops in Iraq again? Uh, I thought we, right? So, I mean, it is, it is kind of a big question. Are we getting sucked into Middle East wars again? And then, oh, by the way, uh, you know, and I don't mean this to sound as partisan as it does, but I'm sorry that, you know, the commander in chief takes two years to have an Oval Office address on uh, why we need to stop Putin in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, you know, on top of the disaster and disgrace that the Afghanistan withdrawal was. So look, I think those questions are right to be asked. What is our, what does success look like uh, in Ukraine? How long are we gonna be bombing the Houthis? They don't seem to be stopping. Uh, is Iran the root of the problem? Uh, and, what is the, and what does it take to reestablish deterrence? And oh, by the way, is this all a distraction from what you, Mike Waltz, have been telling me is the only competitor, you know, aside from Russia's nuclear arsenal, that could truly challenge and defeat us, which is the Chinese Communist Party. So actually, I tell people here all the time in, in DC and my friends in the media, come with me to a come with me to a town hall in North Florida, and I'm looking at firefighters and teachers asking me, are you gonna send another billion dollars? I mean, of course we want to stop Russia, but why are we paying those teachers over there when they're underpaid here? Those are all, I think, actually healthy questions uh, to be asked and uh, and hopefully keep me sharp. I believe in American leadership. I want war, you know, if I, I believe that terrorism will follow us home if we give it a chance, but um, it keeps me sharp and that we don't get into another 20 years of policy drift uh, and that we're not committing our sons and daughters and our treasures in a way that, oh, by the way, we can't afford anymore. Uh, and demanding that our allies step up and share this burden um, doesn't mean you're going to yank us out of NATO. It means that, you know what, um, <laughs> step up. And if you all believe this, uh, as we do, and this is aligned with our values, how did the German parliament vote down its 2% budget five months ago? How does that happen without a response uh, from the United States? So actually, I think it's a, it's a tough <laughs> uh, but healthy part of our system. Well, I think we're coming sadly to the end of our time. I know there was a few more hands in the audience if you want to hang back a little later, the benefit of being in person. Um, I do want to give you a second to have the final words, uh, Congressman Waltz. But um, again, this is a, a significant, it's a strategic issue. And while it may seem that the pressures to respond are still off you know, several years in the future, in order to be ready at that future, because of the timelines it takes to regain a maritime industrial capacity, you're looking at three to five years, and we're already inside the, the danger zone for action. So yeah. final words, sir? Well, uh, it, they'll, be relatively, they'll be relatively brief in the sense that go back and look at the, um, at the summit that she had with Putin uh, in Moscow. And I think these words are going to go down in history when he said, and he said it publicly for mm -hmm. a reason. When she looked at Putin and said, we have a once in a century chance right now to, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but basically to upend this global world order led by the West. Uh, and um, we can't take for granted how our economy runs. Uh, I think the Houthis are giving us a real, 
uh, a real wake-up call right now. Um, but I do think it is part and parcel on how we've let so many key aspects of, uh, of American industry, uh, whether, it is, uh, whether it's manufacturing, whether it is building semiconductors, uh, or whether it's building ships uh, that you know, we have to revitalize. And I think there's a healthy government role uh, in that um, uh, to keep it competitive, um, to, uh, to revitalize, uh, to re-energize, uh, but also uh, defend America's interests. And, and to the point I was just making, we never in our history have faced a peer that has an economy that is rivaling ours, has its own issues to be sure, uh, that I think we could be taking greater advantage of, but an economy and a military that could rival ours on top of Russia, North Korea, Iran, the global threat of terrorism, and the kicker is overlaid with 34 trillion in debt mm -hmm. and climbing. And so um, I think there is a way we can realize real economic benefits uh, and, and grow jobs while also then providing the base layer from a shipping, shipbuilding, and workforce standpoint that our national security and that our Navy can then, can then rest on. And, uh, and I just thank Heritage for being a, a thought leader in that and working with me, which is bicameral, bipartisan. Yes, that does happen uh, in, in this town more than the media likes to report on oh, yes. uh, call for action. So thank you. Thank you again for yeah. your time today. And again, thank you everyone in the audience and everyone online uh, watching this. Uh, I will reiterate, this is a big issue. It is more than just us up on the stage right now and those that were assigned on the president's letter. It's a larger group. And hopefully in the near future, watch this space. We'll have future guests providing further insight, but also updates, and perhaps even have you come back with updates on how things are going as we regain America's maritime security and its maritime competitiveness. Again, thank you all for your time today, and God bless.